you can hear. Yes. OK. Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to briefly tell because many parents ask this question, how SMA is inherited. So all of you know that SMA is genetic condition and it's called as autosomal recessive, which means two genes. We carry two genes for every protein. One come from our father, one come from our mother. So if both genes are faulty or absent, then this condition is present and this type of condition is called as autosomal recessive. So imagine a father has one faulty and one good gene, mother has one faulty and one good gene. So if both give, there are 50% chances that they give, you know, either of the genes. So if by chance both mother and father give the faulty gene to the child, then the child has SMA. Whereas if good genes are carried forward, then the child has no SMA. And again, the status can be same like father and mother, which is called carrier. So if you have one good gene and one faulty gene, that status is called carrier. So overall chances of child having SMA is around 25% provided both mother and father are carrier. Now this happened more commonly, as you can imagine, is the same genetic pool which mother and father are sharing. So that happens more commonly when there are marriages in relation, like marrying cousins and also uh, this, this is what the uh, the inheritance status of SMA is, which is a condition called autosomal recessive. Now, this particular protein called SMN1, I'm sorry, SMN or survival motor neuron protein is required for a healthy muscle. And it is produced mainly by a gene called SMN1, which is a primary gene. There is also a backup gene called SMN2. So for example, as you can see, the SMN gene, one gene, produces most of the protein which is required, which is more than 85%. And the SMN2 gene is the backup gene, which only produces around 10 to 15%. So what happens is if you don't have, on the right side, as you can see, if you don't have SMN1 gene, all the protein which is produced is by the backup gene called SMN2, which is not sufficient because it's only 10 to 15%. And as a result of that, the muscles start getting atrophied and weak because this is not enough protein, which usually would have produced if there was a good SMN1 gene. So based on how much protein is produced in the body by the backup gene called SMN2, we get different types of SMA. So imagine there is no protein produced at all. The children don't survive. They usually don't get even born. But if we have at least two copies of SMN2, which produces like 10 to 15 percent, then the babies still have some protein in the initial life to survive. And then as the cells start dying, they get weaker and weaker. So those babies are called SMA type 1 because the onset we see as a symptom is before the six months and they don't usually achieve sitting because then they get weaker and weaker. Um, once the cells, uh, the entry motor cells, which we call it as, start dying. Now, as you can imagine, the name itself, spinal muscular atrophy, spinal means spinal cord, because most of the cells called motor neuron cells are in the spinal cord. Muscular is because it affects the muscle, and atrophy is because the muscle gets atrophied in this condition. Um, in type 2, you have more backup production by the SMN2. These children can sit, whereas in type 3, you have more copies of SMN2, hence more backup production of uh, this functional protein, these individuals can walk and they present quite late uh, uh, in their childhood. And there's another also called type 4, which presents in very old individuals where they're almost like normal with very, very mild difficulties uh, in the motor activities which can present in their 30s. So as you can see, the type 1 is more severe form of SMA, which presents earlier and these children present uh, more weaker and they have more and more difficulties as they progress in the life. Just some statistics about SMA. Um, it affects almost 1 in 10 to 12,000 lives. More than 1 in 58 people are carrier of this uh, you know, uh, mutation. If untreated, this genetic condition is the second most common fetal autosomal recessive disorder after cystic fibrosis. And we're talking particularly about autosomal recessive conditions. So cystic fibrosis is number one, SMA is number two. More than 90% of untreated patients with SMA type one will not survive or will need 
uh, permanent ventilation support by the age of two years. And it's the leading genetic cause of infant mortality in the absence of any therapeutic intervention. So as you can imagine, if we don't intervene, if we don't treat this disease in time, we will be facing more and more uh, you know, problem in this case. I just wanted to give some uh, case examples uh, just to highlight that how important uh, it is to give this intervention as a team. So, and these are the all real cases uh, because we in uh, Medicare Hospital, we do a gene therapy program for the children. And these are some of the cases uh, from our case cohort. So this is a 13 old, a 13 month old boy um, who had come to Dubai to uh, see our team. He was diagnosed with SMA uh, at two and a half months. It's not SMA type two, it's SMA type one, but diagnosed at two and a half months of age. This child's birth weight was 2.7 kilogram, quite healthy child at birth. Luckily, the nucinacin is a type of medication, as you all know, is uh, one of the first medication to, uh, you know, we've been using in SMA, which actually produces more functional protein with the help of SMN2, uh, um, is kind of uh, the gene. Um, the only thing, this child's breathing has been affected, uh, but I don't think they were uh, seeing any pediatric pulmonologists, but they got access by BiPAP, which the parents are giving in sleep, and all the settings are parent control because there's no regular follow by the pediatric respiratory uh, uh, pediatrician. Somebody, the pediatrician had recognized that, you know, this child was getting recurrent infection. So let's avoid the oral feed because there's a risk of aspiration. Because again, your oral, uh, oral, oral muscles can get weak and you have the risk of aspiration. And the parents had come to get the gene therapy. I just wanted to share the picture of this child at the age of 13 months and this is the campaign they have been raising on uh, instagram and look at the nutritional status of the child so when i saw the child in the clinic he was severely severely malnourished there was lack of multidisciplinary input uh, where they come from the blood levels showed abnormal liver functions so obviously the albumin the protein was very low because of the malnutrition and our pediatric pulmonologist saw the child and immediately assessed that the breathing, the BiPAP in sleep is not sufficient. We need the support in the daytime also when the child is away. And the tracheostomy was recommended for the child because, of course, the BiPAP by mask was not just sufficient to maintain the blood gases. Of course, the child was fed by two, but as you could see, the child's weight was so low. And the current weight, now I told you the child's age was 13 months. The birth weight was 2.7, and when I saw the child as 13 months, he had just gained around 1,200 grams, and this is the child now. So, you know, after kind of two, three weeks, he has gained another 200 grams, and he was weighing, as you can see on the scale, just four kilograms. A lot of issues, as you can see, the breathing is not supported, needs tracheostomy, needs, certainly needs gastrostomy, there's severe malnutrition, the liver enzymes are all over the place, the blood protein is low, and the parents want this miracle drug called gene therapy. And I have to say no, because you know we have to sort out a lot of things before even we go for therapeutic intervention. What was good about this child is this child has received mucinacin, which was good. But again, I wish the child was looked after in a multidisciplinary way uh, to you know make him more eligible for gene therapy. Certainly, uh, when we assess the children for gene therapy, we have to look for all these issues. Another case to highlight, a 14-year-old boy, quite old, as you can imagine, he must be type 2, as I just explained you the type uh, types of SMA. His weight was 28 kg. Now, just to highlight, we give gene therapy to anybody less than 21 kg in the UAE. Some countries give according to the age, where they only give after two years, but we follow um, the 21 kg kilogram irrespective of the, the age. Now, this child was 28 kg. He was diagnosed SMA by the age of six months. And uh, over the period of time, the team, the local team, had thought that he's not suitable for nucinacin. I'll explain why. He was uh, gastrostomy fed, some part they were giving by orally as well. He was tracheostomy ventilated 24 7. And now the parents also approached us for gene therapy. When I told them that we cannot give gene therapy for anybody about 21, 
they were even ready to starve the child and you know make him 21 kg, which is of course not ethical, not ideal. This is the child, as you can see, is lying in the bed. Uh, you would imagine that okay, he's fine, you know, he looks well. Uh, unlike the previous child, he's having tracheostomy, he's taken care with the ventilation. Um, but yes, weight was a, a hurdle for us. But look at his spine x-ray. I don't think you need to be a doctor to just comment on his spine. It's completely like a C or S shape and is a bad, bad scoliosis because of the weakness of the trunk muscles. Look at the condition of his spine. Irrespective of what we do, let's say if you keep mucinous and gene therapy, this child will never sick. You know, despite being type two, despite being 14 years of age, again, if you had looked at his spine properly, the bone health properly, the physiotherapy would have been done properly. And if let's say the nucinus in gene therapy is given after that, I hope that this child could have said because 14 year old type two, I would have imagined even you know after gene therapy walking child at this age. But with this kind of spine and with this kind of poor care, I don't think the gene therapy could have been useful even if the child was not 28 kg or eligible. But that shows you now this child is undergoing the spinal surgery. We are offering him something else. Um, risk plum and hopefully you know things will get better. But this just shows the importance of multidisciplinary approach. It's not just the medication; it's everything. You know, your bone, spine, physio, muscles, breathing, nutrition. Everything has to be taken care of as uh, you know as we're dealing with a human, not just uh, giving some miracle drug here. So of course, the gene therapy was no for him. Now. This is just the model of care for any child with SMA. Child is in center. Your family and child has to be treated as one unit. So family is immediately adjacent um, to the child here. Just see if I can get my marker. Yeah, so there's a family here. And your multidisciplinary experts are around the child. Um, so your first thing is a genetic. The counseling is very important because as I said, most of the parents asked, what are the chances of my second child getting the SMA? Of course, once the diagnosis is there, it's important to meet the genetic team, get the genetic counseling done, and get that diagnosis explained. There are other few different rare types of SMA, but I'm not going to go into detail. The commonest form is called 5Q, but that is to your genetic team to explain that. Physio, very, very important. Even before the problem process, I think, the physio intervention should be there, and I'll leave that to Kushbu to uh, you know, explain the principles of physiotherapy. Orthopedic, we just saw one good example of spine management, how the spine, the hips, because hip joints are again very prone to dislocate. They are very shallow uh, kind of joints. So once the, the stretching occurs, once the contract occurs, the hip joints simply can dislocate easily. Psychological support, because you can imagine the tremendous kind of um, the depression, anxiety, uh, the financial strain the families go through. And it's equally important that we should not neglect the psychological support to the parents, even to the siblings, because you know they often get neglected uh, while the parents are focusing on the affected child. Their jobs and the social support is equally important. Um, palliative care less and less these days, since the therapeutic intervention is there, but yes, there are some cases where we need to address the palliative care for these children. Pulmonary care, as we just saw, um, we have to monitor because this, this is the silent killer. Your uh, the, the swallow muscles are weak, the feed can go in the wrong end, it can cause pneumonia, it can cause you know aspiration, recurrent aspiration. Not only that, the breathing muscles are weak, so you're not effectively contracting the chest, you're not effectively giving the oxygen to the brain and other part of the body. And we breathe for two purposes. One is to get the oxygen and the other is to give out the carbon dioxide. So that has to be maintained and that can be evident with your blood gas and you know other parameters which the pulmonary uh, pediatrician can assess. Nutrition, very, very important. As I said, this mother was ready to starve the child, but that is literally not, not advisable. Um, we have to monitor their growth. We have to monitor their weight and height as we do for any other child. And the last thing is the novel therapies, which uh, is like a gene therapy we are calling. So this is a part of uh, the multidisciplinary approach. This is not the only solution for these children, and that is why the multidisciplinary approach for these children is very, very important. So just briefly, what are the things we should focus in these children? 
So respiratory, um, they must, must see a pulmonologist. We're lucky to have a very good pulmonologist in our team. They should take the vaccine. And again, the whole strategy is to prevent the things rather than treat when they occur. So like flu vaccine, very, very cheap and routinely available all over. RSV is slightly costly, but if we can get this under insurance and monthly, especially for the winter term, that's good, especially for children younger than two years. Um, respiratory secretions, because as you can imagine, they can't cough. When we have any secretion, we can displace them <clears throat> easily, but because of the weakness of the chest muscle, weakness of the cough, they cannot mobilize the secretion. So manually, we have to mobilize that with the help of chest physiotherapy. And there are other modalities which we can use to mobilize the secretion because the stagnant secretions attract the bacteria and attract the infection. So, and of course, they can block the airways. So you have to move this, uh, these secretions or sputum. And cough assist machine, machine can, of course, uh, be a very helpful tool to do that way. At home, uh, pulse oximetry is a good kind of indicator to see how much oxygen the body is getting. As I said, if you don't breathe properly uh, or effectively, you get less oxygen. So that can be a good indicator to see how much oxygen the body is getting. If the child is on BiPAP or any ventilator, of course, there are two ways. One is the nasal mask and other ways the tracheostomy. We always train the parent how to look after the machine, how to do the suctioning. The settings, of course, are directed by their doctors and they can change uh, or disconnect the child and connect the child as per the regime given by the pediatric So, of course, the parent's role is very, very important for looking after the children, you know, including the fact that they have to learn the chest physio principles as well. Bone and spine, because I always tell the principle of physiotherapy is again to avoid the contractures and also to maintain the strain, but you have to have underlying bone a bit strong enough to hold the skeleton. Scoliosis is one of the very common complications we see purely because your trunk muscles are weak and with the gravity, the body starts collapsing, um, you know, giving rise to the scoliosis S-shape or C-shape spine. And scoliosis, because the spine bends, chest can cause the deformity because of the shape. Uh, you could have seen that in the X-ray I've shown. And that itself mechanically reduces the capacity of the chest and the lungs, causing more insufficiency for breathing problem. And of course, more is the scoliosis. You have to surgically intervene to correct the spine. A very mild can be corrected with the orthotic device. You know, the spine can be just made straight with the help of that. But in the worst situations, a surgical intervention like that child I showed you needs surgery, definitely. Hips are very common, as I just said, because they can easily pop out of the joint uh, because the joint is very shallow. And they are the, one of the most common joints to come out. And the surveillance of the hip and spine is very important. Contractures can happen because the muscle is weak. You're not using it and the joints can easily get contracted. The fractures can happen in the weak bones. That's why it's important to keep the bone healthy. So it's a simple principle. We go to gym, we do the exercise and the bones and muscle are stronger. Less and less muscle we use, less and less bones we use, they get more fragile and weaker. So that's why vitamin D and calcium like supplements do help. Um, positioning and bracing is important because again, if I leave the child without bracing with the gravity, with the other back posture, uh, the contractures can happen and the shape can become very poor. So sitting systems or head support or thoracic support and the orthosis, this child is standing here with the help of this orthosis here. And you know, it's very well taken care as you can see in the picture. Stretching is important part of the physiotherapy because it does maintain the range of movement of the joint. Because if you don't move the joint actively or passively, the joint can become more stiff and evidently can become contracted. So we have to avoid the contracture because once the contractures are there, surgery is the only option to release the contracture. So it's important to avoid their surgical intervention. Bracing, of course, can reduce the chances of contractures. And not only the physiotherapist, because, you know, you're going to physiotherapist, let's say, once in a week or twice a week, but rest of the days, in a regular basis, the parents have to learn the principles of physiotherapy, um, uh, set the goals, and also, uh, you know, do the things like stretching and all at home. Nutrition, equally important, and we give a lot of emphasis on nutrition to our children. 
affected with SMA. Uh, dietitian and nutritionist are important part of our team. Um, so we follow the weight and height over the time. Swallow is very important because this is a silent kind of thing, you know, that the milk or liquid can be trickling down the lungs or the, from the trachea to the lungs without even noticing because they can't cough. If we have something going in the wrong way, we can cough and show that, you know, something is not right. But these children may not show the sign and that can be a silent killer. So repeated chest infection is another indicator that your swallow may not be good here. And that can affect on your weight grown, on the nutrition, Child, children can have repeated chest infections. And, and the weaker children like type 1 and the non citrus are more at risk. And early gastrostomy uh, is, a, is a kind of uh, advisable thing because you know you cannot put the nasal, the nasal acidic tube for a long time. And gastrostomy is the most safer. Parents are very happy after the gastrostomy, believe me. Maintaining balanced diet, supplements of so vitamin D and other minerals and vitamins. Minimizing fasting, adequate fluid intake, electrolyte balance, everything is as important as any other child without SMA. These children often present to our emergency department and the parents, for the parents, it's important to recognize the signs when to take the child to emergency. When is the emergency? So again, it's important to ask the doctor, okay, what are the signs that I should be aware of? When do I need to take my child to emergency? Understanding comorbidities of the particular child is important. As I said, it's a vast um, a spectrum. Some children which are type two, type three, type one. So it's important what the child has, um, the affected child has. Breathing problems are most commonly presented. As I said, it can be ventilator related or mechanical problem. Infections, they can easily catch the infection. So to have low threshold for treating with antibiotics, Pseudomonas, for example, is a colonizing bacteria, and often you take the swab and the children are positive with that. Aspiration, if the child is not uh, having gastrostomy or NGP, they are more common risk for aspiration and aspiration pneumonia in returns. So if, if the neck and jaw muscles have contractures and the weakness, often the children have problem in intubation. Our uh, max special surge, uh, surgeon is actually doing a study on this, you know, if, if the gene therapy is uh, giving a favorable result on that. Clearing secretion is very important because more and more secretions are stagnant in the chest. They call for infection. They attract the bacteria. So um, secretion reduction is very common. The most common medication we use is a patch called scopoderm or an oral medication called glycoparlate. Cough assist and chest physio can also help with these. So it's a balance of all these things. And this shows the importance of seeing all the doctors, your gastroenterologists, the pediatric respiratory medicine, emergency doctor, pediatrician, nutritionist, physiotherapist, orthopedist, occupational therapist, everybody is equally, equally important. So in summary, there is no substitute to multidisciplinary management. There is nothing called as a magic drug. Don't, uh, it's not that my child will get the gene therapy and everything will be reversed. It doesn't happen. Any cell which is dead is dead. I cannot revive or make any cell alive. And that is why earlier the better. So the early intervention will be, if let's say if I give any gene therapy or spin darga or any other drug to a pre-symptomatic child, even before the symptoms are present, I may be able to avoid the symptom because the protein is produced in that way. So earlier is the better and the studies have also shown that way. Prevention is better, of course, because you know if I can avoid scoliosis, if I can avoid the contracture, it's important than dealing with the problem and of course, the whole focus, I'll just tell the parent, and we are doing the study by putting the questionnaire before and after gene therapy in our center is improving the quality of life. And this is, parents are the proxy of the children, um, you know, for the quality of life. And the whole emphasis, in not just giving the drug and not making them live, it is to improve the quality of life. And you can imagine, it's a broad term, it's a subjective term but every parent understands what the quality of life my child is, and this is where the management is important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Vivek. Thank you for the talk. Uh, sir, um, I would like to emphasize, as you have covered mainly a lot of things about rehab in the talk, but I would like to also add something uh, and ask you uh, that, uh, up until now, when as a therapist, when we were treating any children with spinal muscular atrophy or muscular dystrophy, any neurodegenerative disorders, the 
exercise rational was usually focusing mainly on preserving the muscle function, uh, preventing contractures, splint, uh, splint prescription, and mainly when the child is in the initial stage of the disease. So uh, the exercise prescription would focus on progressive resistive, moderate intensity exercise. And yes. as the child is in the advanced stage of the disease. Okay, so the exercise rational focus is mainly on maintenance therapy like regressive resistive exercises. So uh, I want to know that if a child who comes to us after receiving gene therapy, so should we treat this child as any child with neurodevelopment disorders, how we treat any kid with neurodevelopment disorders, or we are still, like if you can just emphasize on this point. I think it's a cross-sectional uh, assessment at every time without even predicting the future, you know, what am I going to expect after the gene therapy? Because if I say, put the goal for next few months, okay, the child is now received the gene therapy. Let's say the child is not holding the hair at the moment. I can help the, hold the head with support. Of course, you can target on that and, uh, you know, see if we can achieve that. Our physiotherapists are also seeing that there's a better trunk control, but that's with the time. You know, one cannot predict, okay, with the gene therapy, this must happen. With, of course, the good care, we have seen the children achieving the milestone. One of my children is actually one house, type one is walking with the walker, you know, can take a few steps. But that is uh, in the cross-sectional assessment. And with every child, let's assume any child, so cerebral palsy is a static, but even if we assume this kind of a progressive, so I have to set the goal for a certain period of time, you know, next four months, I have to achieve this thing and let's work on that rather than predicting, you know, few years from down the line. So it's it's important to target the muscles. What is the current goal of the child, and just work on that. Of course, if you see something positive, you have to take that further. Okay, now the child is able to hold the head. There's a better head control, or let's say trunk control. Can I focus on the sitting with support? Can I focus on this? So that kind of step by step approach has to be there. I feel rather than you know uh, taking that goal ten step ahead. So let let's I think uh, step by step is very important. Sir, actually, uh, recently uh, I had seen, I had the chance to see few kids who had received gene therapy and they had come to us for an intensive therapy program. So what I want to emphasize is that uh, as a rehab professional, the parents or even, of course, you, not only you, but other doctors should not only emphasize in receiving physiotherapy as the main rehab uh, team for this kid, but also other professionals like occupational therapist, speech and language therapist, because uh, like when we treated uh, recently some kids for an intensive therapy program, like they had come for intensive therapy program, we assessed them with the various kids like chop instant, six minute walk test, no, not six minute walk test because they were non-ambulatory, but manual muscle testing. And what I had observed at the end of two weeks, there were kids uh, where they did not have head control. They had better head control. They also achieved some new milestones. Like these were the kids who just had the ability to turn. But they achieved rolling. They also achieved transitions, like so fine to sit. But I believe that this we could only achieve because we treated the kid as a team and not me alone who addressed the kid. Absolutely. And uh, this is where the teamwork, and that's what I was trying to tell in my talk, that it's a teamwork, yeah. it's not just one person's job. You know, uh, imagine uh, we get a lot of children in the push chair, you know, just the horizontal, the child is, let's say, two-year-old and still lying flat, although has the ability mm -hmm. to sit or hold the head or could have sat with support. And we humans are designed to be vertical, not horizontal like the other animal. And that's where, you know, the orthotics can come into picture, the occupational therapy, you know, assessing for the sitting support, the mobility, everything is important. When I say quality of life, that's not the quality of life, lying flat in the bed. If the child has the ability to mobilize, go in the park, enjoy the sunlight, enjoy, you know, the parks, you know, it doesn't matter how. If the parents can assist that in a proper wheelchair, proper push chair, whatever it is, you know, depend on the child's ability, depend on the child's, uh, you know, uh, I won't say disability, but ability. So this is where the team is important, your hand functions, your neck control. So yeah, one person job is not sufficient. It's not just physio. It has to be with the help of occupational therapy, orthotic team, and the other team members for the different comorbidities. Yeah. I would also like to emphasize that uh, a lot of rehab professionals, 
usually children with mus uh, spinal muscular atrophy especially the type 2 and 3 uh, you know the children who are able to uh, sit even stand with the help of hkf4 like they can maintain standing they have muscle power in the initial stages above 3 they may have in certain muscles uh, physios usually start uh, children with weight training like high intensity exercises but isn't it important that we uh, as a rational follow moderate intensity exercise and not weight training because including uh, sorry introducing high intensity weight training is going to increase the muscle load and can cause fast degeneration in the progression of the disease because yeah. So that's the principle I said, step by step, not to go, you know, five steps and six steps ahead. Uh, we're not going to achieve, uh, you know, anything out of that rather than causing damage. So, um, as I said, you have to assess the strength and then move forward to that. Um, so we have a lot of uh, motor skills. You just mentioned a few things as well, you know, and with the help of that, with the we can target what is the next step now, what we achieve, and so on. We can go on. So the principle of Physiotherapy, as I just said, I, I simplified to the parents is maintaining the joint range and also maintaining the strength. You know, we're not creating a bodybuilder here, but we have to focus on the child's abilities and then move one step ahead. So that's where the... Uh, yes, the and I also is. agree that uh, the physiotherapy, the child is going to see us, even if they see us every day, we are still going to see the kid only for one hour. Activity has to be on throughout the day. They are at the end of the day, they are kids. So instead of just perform like uh, designing simple some exercises and which is boring for the kid, they may not even participate well in the exercise. So it's important that we as therapists create activities in form of play to engage the child along with the parents throughout the day, right? Yeah. And uh, also, sir, uh, we can see if there are some participants who would like to ask you or me some questions. So I can yeah. see in the chat box or if anybody has any questions, they can write in the chat box. One thing I, I just want to advise the parents is knowing the concept of WHO ICF classification. You know, I, I, it will be too much of a talk. It's very important what, what is impairment, what is participation, what actually the concept of it is. It's a different talk, but I think it's it's good for every parent with who's ever, the, you know, the children are uh, having any disability to understand that concept because at the end of the day, all the physicians should focus through that model. It's not just correcting the impairment, it's just increasing their participation is important. Also, so like I would just like to give emphasis that uh, achieving walking is not the only milestones these kids need. Like usually I've seen that uh, the emphasis is given only on walking, like the child should achieve walking, but there are many other activities that the child first, first should receive. Like also like in terms of achieving exercise, if we are putting increasing the load on the spine, they can get scoliosis, right? I mean, if the scoliosis is not managed. That's right, that's right. Yes. Okay, so I'll just see if there are any questions. Okay, so sir, there is one question. Uh, by Mr. Mohammed Kamal, and the question is: Thanks a lot for the informative lecture. Please, I want to ask about the FITT protocol for a patient nine years old with SMA type four. Do you recommend intensive therapy for this patient? So, you, you can answer that question more the effective than me. But I think it's it's you know for me, I would assist the child. To, you know, in components, yeah. uh, just like we do our chop and tend score from neck muscles to the ankle muscles and target the problem areas. You know, if I feel that the ankles are tighter, you know, focus on that. If I feel, you know, if the child can hold the knee flexion against gravity for more than a second, so I'll focus on strengthening that. So it's, it's for me, it's the problem areas I focus I know as a child, as a whole, you would want intensive therapy and do so. There's no blanket regime for any child. It has to be targeted um, as per the goal. So 
that's that's why I always tell the parents sit with your therapist, set the goal planning. You know, there's a goal planning meeting has to be there with your speech therapy, with your speech therapy yeah. physio, and work towards that. You know, set the timeline. Okay, for this particular A B C, six months. There's a four months. There's a five months. Whatever it is, and then you know move towards that. Sit again after five months and see if we have achieved the goal and what were the drawbacks. So that's very important to go step by step. So over to you. I mean, I don't know what you want to comment. So on. yeah, I do. I feel this are you correct. So that's exactly what I mentioned. That why intensive therapy models work is because first of all, the tribe, the child is the center, and all the therapists are available at one place. Uh, intensive therapy programs are usually designed first of all, uh, first we understand the child's condition. Uh, we receive the reports, child's condition way before they want to come here for intensive therapy. Uh, goals are discussed, decided with the parents, along with the parents and the other professional. Uh, if required, we involve other team members, other medical team members like orthopedic surgeon, pulmonologist. Okay, and based on that, we the outcomes that we see are better rather than child individually treated by either a PT or OT or speech. But in my experience, I have seen that usually the only therapist that manages a spinal muscular atrophy case is usually PTs or orthotist. Like I have not seen awareness for involving occupational therapist or speech therapist or swallowing therapist early on. So intensive therapy model gives that opportunity uh, to the kid and the families. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, we have somebody start. Uh, so this question is most of the SMA therapies. Okay, you can read it. Okay. Nice to see you, Sandeep. Uh, yeah, you know that there are trials going on with the you know targeting the muscle specifically, um, the, the, the small molecules. Hopefully soon we should be able to get uh, new drugs targeting the muscle specifically. Um, uh, yeah, at the moment no. But hopefully, a few years down the line, we should be. So uh, you must be knowing there are research that is going on. In this field. Um, uh, hello, Dr. Vivek. Hi, hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Uh, just listening to your, your presentation. Uh, yes, I, I too heard about this uh, new therapy that targets muscle, and it was being I started in some of the countries in Europe, uh, but I was yeah. not aware of like how. No, we haven't started uh, yet. We haven't started it. Uh, it's still in the research phase at the moment. Uh, New molecules are still in the research. I mean, UK has one site at the moment. And uh, yeah, so hopefully the new drugs are in the pipeline. So Biogen and uh, the other, other. So there are a lot of research going on at the moment. Uh, in the field of SNA, which is very good actually. So, um, and I've got uh, the different slide, but I don't want to give in that uh, detail. So, ASOs, the new uh, muscle enhancing agents, it is something in Biogen which is producing BIIB 110. Um, so, they are there, that's, that's in the research process. I hope in a couple of years' time we'll be able to get something yeah. new. Yeah, right now I think they are focusing mostly on the ambulatory type SMA. That's yeah, not, that's not yeah. like my yeah, daughter. That, <laughs> yeah, because that, that's what the research is about, isn't it? We would focus in a very well children because we don't know whether there are side effects and we don't want a lot of 
uh, you know, associated thing. So they will focus on the, the ambulatory patient and then gradually move towards the more severe patient. So same like gene therapy, when are having IV and now we are more kind of doing the research on the older children, the complex children. Now we are doing the intrathecal gene therapy is also in the pipeline. So let's see what happens. You know, time will tell how these effects are effective in both type of children. Uh, one more question, Dr. Bibek, sir. Uh, yeah. uh, this is this is uh, uh, in relation to my daughter. Uh, yeah. But all of the <clears throat> all of those SMA kids who are who have tachystomy and who have a cough type tachystomy from yeah. beginning. Uh, what is the chance or what is the experience uh, regarding such patients? Uh, like they are able to speak later on with uh, with therapy and because uh, I'm not sure. Like uh, uh, so. Uh, you know, the first thing is closure of tracheostomy, if uh, the speaker on. So we are very early to comment on that because we started the gene therapy just two years before. Uh, you were one of the first ones to see. Uh, and we were one of the centers to deal with the complex children, as you know. We have done recently presented our data of 11 children, but that was mainly focusing, you know, reducing the secretions, the respiratory secretions, increasing the time of the ventilation, which you all already seen in your child also. And this is the data which we presented. But as of now, I don't think we have focused on the speech. Uh, eventually, I'm hoping, you know, once we are at the stage that the child doesn't need tracheostomy at all, we will be able to close and focus on that. So I think that stage will come, but it's just two years and we are we're not there yet. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Because we, we would like to hear out soil voice, like she is yeah. of tachystomy yeah. and uh, she's not able to swallow, That's so right. we cannot, at least That's if right. she could be shifted to the uncuffed one, not a cuffed yeah. one, I mean uncuffed yeah. one, and she can use uh, the, this Absolutely. space device. Absolutely. Uh, so so you might know one Filipino family, so they are, they are trying at the moment. See, you are in contact with them also. I had one child uh, whom we are planning to close the tracheostomy also. I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, in a few months' time or a few years' okay. time, we'll be getting the answer. <laughs> okay. oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vivek. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. I'm sorry for this initial glitch. I, mean, I don't know what has happened to them. I had to restart. <laughs> Thank you. We can, uh, we don't have any more questions. Thank you, everyone, for participating and being part of the talk today.